Welcome back everybody. Today I'll be covering most of Link's Zonai and Puripad abilities. I've sorted these tips by ability and will proceed in order of the abilities with the least tips to the abilities with the most tips. If you've tuned into previous videos in this series, expect to hear me repeat a few tips just for the sake of thoroughness. Let's start with the camera. Believe it or not, this is one of my most used abilities. The variable zoom makes it more practical than the Puripad scope, so you can scout enemy encampments from a comfortable distance or sit back and watch groups of enemies tear each other to shreds. Another useful feature of the camera is that it will ping and highlight when something in the compendium is the focal point of your shot. Well, that's obviously how it works, but you can use this to sweep areas for wildlife. For example, use it at a lake where it's difficult to see through the surface of the water and to gauge how many fish are in there, if any. If your camera pings a lot, then you'll know that it'll be worth chucking a shock fruit into the water. Now let's briefly talk about Rewind. I mentioned before how it shouldn't be underestimated since it's a powerful combat ability. I won't get into specific examples here, but you can use it against virtually every enemy that throws projectiles at you. Speaking of combat, have you ever killed a monster on a slope or in the water and then watched their loot fall or drift far beyond your reach? Rewind has no range limits. If you know that the object is somewhere on your screen, then you can rewind it. I've used this to return lost monster parts to me, and I even used it in a shrine when I could not see the object. It was too small for my eyes to catch it, but Rewind recognized it and I was able to cheese the shrine. Next up is Ascend. How cool was this ability when you saw it in the first trailer? There are a couple of interesting things about how Ascend works. The first is that there is a very short cooldown if you unsuccessfully activate the ability. In other words, if you press A when your reticle is red, then you won't be able to press A again for a split second. Does that mean not to spam the ability when you're in a hurry to use it? Should you rely on your reflexes and try to time the green reticle? It's up to you. I've tried to make it a habit to time my button press, but I can't say for certain if I'm getting the ability off more consistently. You've probably noticed that when you have Ascend selected, the surrounding areas turn to various shades of grey. If you look up at the ceiling, you'll know which spots meet the height requirement for Ascend, since they'll be a much brighter, lighter grey. You don't have to waste your time running the reticle over areas that aren't the same colour. Ascend isn't the only ability that casts a different colour over the surrounding area, but it most strongly affects the ground. Remember this, because there may come a time in the game when you're struggling to navigate through heavy fog, and Ascend will be the most helpful for highlighting the ground so that you don't go walking off a cliff. Now for one of the big abilities, Ultra Hand. I'll keep repeating this next tip till I'm blue in the face. Scanning your environment for collectibles and usable objects is one of the most valuable features of this ability. If you played Breath of the Wild, then you probably did this with Stasis. Not only is it tremendously helpful for gathering resources, but it can also highlight objects in your search for Koroks. Those little pots that they hide in are sure to stand out from the environment, and you'll recognize them from far away. Just this morning, I flashed the ability for a quick look around an area, as I always do, and I saw a single rock illuminated on a cliff. Sure enough, that ended up having a Korok underneath. What else can you do with Ultra Hand? Many of you probably use it to lift and break crates already, since that's a decent way to save on weapon durability. Have you tried using it to reach faraway objects like palm fruit high up in the trees or bomb flowers that are across a small pond inside a cave? In the former instance, you'll probably need something like a log or a stray weapon and then attach the palm fruit to whatever you're holding. It's tedious because that object you're holding will fall, but it saves you from having to shoot arrows or chop down the tree. You know when doing something like that is more practical? Remember earlier when I talked about monsters dying and their loot being lost in the water? Well, you may actually find yourself in situations where the fastest solution to your problem is taking a log, using it as a fishing pole, and hauling every bit of loot out of the water after attaching the loot to the log. Last, but certainly not least, is our section on the fuse ability. This video would run way too long if I decided to detail every fusion that I found cool or interesting, so I'll try to be selective when I cover specific fusions. Before all of that, there are a couple of tips that I want to mention for beginners specifically. First, you can use Fuse to identify Zonai objects. Zonai objects don't normally display name tags when you stand near them, so you could get confused between the different emitters, but the Fuse ability will allow you to identify what's on the ground. Second, my general advice when starting out is to Fuse whenever you have the opportunity to. I'm talking about a boulder that you might need for smashing ore deposits, or a flame emitter that you saw in a shrine. Maybe a rocket out in the field, pop that on your shield. 
Maybe fusing two weapons together is going to make your strongest weapon for the early portions of the game. You can always remove the fused item later if you find something better or don't need it. I would just keep one shield bare for shield surfing. Now I've got general advice for all players. There are different fusion attachment types in the game. A few examples are hammers, fans, and blades. You can make hammers with rocks and horriblin parts, fans with Korok fronds and wooden boards, and blades with most monster parts in the game. Those hammers in particular are great for smashing ore deposits and killing taluses, but I've got something even better for ore deposits. Do you remember your first time slaying a talus and seeing its heart lying lifelessly on the ground? Sounds morbid, I know. Anyway, how many of you, like me, accidentally fused it to your shield thinking that it would be some super defensive item? That was a mistake, but it turns out that fusing blunt weapon attachments to your shields can actually be useful. My newest and preferred way of farming ores and breaking crates is actually by using a shield with a blunt or hammer attachment. Unlike when you've got a rock on a weak weapon, a rock on a shield will always break ore deposits in one strike. And guess what? It's even faster than swinging a weapon. Now we can get into some more specific fusions. I'll keep this list short, but feel free to flood the comments section with all of your favorites. I love all elemental attachments, but I'm most fond of ice. Its usefulness outside of combat is greater than the other two options, since it can freeze water and help you cross rivers or create platforms to reach chests. Stall items are some of the most fun to play with. Yes, they're incredibly brittle, but they're so powerful. A couple of fused Bokoblin arms will be tremendous when starting out, but even if you already have an arsenal of strong weapons, fused Lazalfos arms can make one of the stronger boomerangs in the game. Korok weapons have the unique benefit of not consuming or breaking what the game calls bursting attachments. While the weapons may seem low on attack power, you can use them to inflict negative status effects on your enemies. Attachments like Muddle Buds, Puff Shrooms, and Dazzle Fruit are especially fun to play around with. Eyeball attachments seem to be devastating against most enemies in the game. They'll home in on some enemies' weak points, and you can fire them fairly comfortably behind cover. Elemental eyeballs will take out a particular flying enemy in the Gerudo region in one shot. What about wing attachments, and especially the elemental key swings? I tried them on boomerangs to extend the range and to get multiple uses out of them. These super boomerangs are great out in the open, but be mindful near any obstructions. That said, if your boomerang ever clatters to the ground, you can always recall it, and it will deal damage on the way back. I didn't come up with this next one, but my friend suggested something amazing with the gloom weapons. Use them as fusion attachments if you don't want the hassle of your life draining. The fused weapons are hideous, but I still think it's a great tip. Our last tip also comes from someone else, a commenter in the Tips for Exploring video. Rizwan Naim suggested fusing rubies or sapphires to your shields to protect you from the elements. That way, you don't have to worry about them breaking on your weapons, which you would be using much more often. I also tried the gems on my shields for combat purposes, and they worked amazingly well in those situations too. Like I said earlier, the list of fun and powerful fusions can go on and on, but I'm going to stop there. Thank you, as always, to everyone who contributes in the comments sections. I'm looking forward to hearing what you all suggest on this topic. Thank you to everyone else for watching, and I hope that I was able to share something new with you, hopefully something useful. See you next time in the final tips video.